All right, I'm going to start with a quote. And um, it's a quote from a woman named Emily White, who a number of you may be familiar with in this room. Um, Emily was an intern at National Public Radio, and she wrote an opinion piece for National Public Radio website. And this article that she wrote, I think, kind of inadvertently put her in the center of the debate of the subject matter we're having today. She's gotten a lot of flack for this article, but I'm going to read a couple of things that she said that are going to kind of maybe set the, the mood for us today. Here's Emily. I wish I could say I miss album packaging and liner notes and rue the decline in album sales the digital world has caused. But the truth is, I've never supported physical music as a consumer. As monumental a role as musicians and albums have played in my life, I've never invested money in them aside from concert tickets and t-shirts. As I've grown up, I've come to realize the gravity of what file sharing means to the musicians I love. I can't support them with concert tickets and t-shirts alone, but I honestly don't think my peers and I will ever pay for albums. I do think we'll pay for convenience. Nancy, I'm going to start with you. There's a number of artists crying foul, angry that the systems that were once in place that protected artists and their creations are being sabotaged by large corporations and consumer demands for convenience. How do you frame this debate in terms of intellectual property? I think people may feel that things are changing, um, and certainly the technologies are changing really quickly. I'm not sure the laws are changing as quickly. And I think actually part of the problem with where we are today, where it's actually hard for, lawyer, for artists to get paid for many of the things that they're doing that people want. For, for example, Spotify doesn't pay very well to artists. Part of the problem there actually sometimes has to do with the fact that the laws haven't changed as quickly as the technologies have. Um, but I also like to frame the problem of today um, and everybody saying, you know, all these protections that artists used to have and you can't be successful the way you used to be successful. Um, the fact is that some of the late 20th century systems filtered out a lot of artists who have new options and new ways of reaching new audiences today that they did not have um, prior to the advent of the internet and cheap personal recording technologies. So. so explain that though a little more like these artists that were somehow filtered out. What do you mean by that? What, what things were in their way um, that no longer exist that give them this kind of freedom you're talking about? I'm not sure that those kinds of filters no longer exist. Um, there used to be, and, and to some large extent still is, a system of people who work for record companies, who work for distribution systems, who picked who their distribution system was going to distribute. And if you go back far enough, um, there were very exploitative choices um, it made in those systems, especially um, for artists of color and artists who came from poor or uneducated backgrounds. Um, but many artists from less advantaged backgrounds actually did well in those systems. Um, just that there are artists who haven't ever been particularly commercially appealing who would never have been able to access any level of commercial success in systems where they had to rely on gatekeepers who were making choices about what would be the most popular sales um, option. Today, there are some artists who are using other technologies, um, other ways of connecting with fan bases, especially the internet, to reach groups that would have been too dispersed to be worth the investment in prior, um, more industrial systems. The flip side of that is, of course, there are some artists today who, who uh, would never be able to mobilize an internet fan base, maybe because they're appealing in a different way. So. So it costs money to make records. I mean, I, I think it's, it's that, that's the thing that is frequently gets lost in, in the mix of this in terms of like you, you're talking about, um, I remember one of the first times that I became aware of the fact that the rules of the game had changed all of a sudden. I got an email from a fan um, and they said, I can't believe that you're charging $10 for a CD. This is a joke. I know that I can go to the, you know, Office Max and purchase a blank CD for, you know, a quarter, essentially, and then I can rip your music and it doesn't, and, and so my total investment is a quarter, and you're trying to charge $10, I'll never buy anything by you again, and I was kind of like, you know, put on notice 
that first of all, you know, the fans had this facility to be able to, uh, to rip a CD and stuff, and they had a, a notion of how much the means of production cost, but I think it was a, a kind of an incomplete picture. You know, for almost any artist, there's a significant investment in terms of, you know, instruments, studio equipment, or studio rental, things like that to make the record happen. And, you know, you love doing it so much that you'll always do it, or you, you have to do it, but you'd like to think that you could sell it for more than a quarter, you know, a, a copy or something like that, so that you could actually make it break even. Tim. Adam, if I could just jump in um, to, to frame the issue from copyright perspective, because I think that is helpful to discuss where we're going with this. Um, the only thing that has changed is the distribution model for music, for film, for content with the internet. Um, we're still talking about copyright, which is not the physical product, the CD that we're talking about, but rather the right to copy, the right to sell, the right to distribute, the right to make derivative works, the right to perform a work publicly, the right to display your work, uh, and the sound recording digital performance right. So we're talking about an intangible right. That's what copyright is. And so we have to sort of divorce ourselves between what is physical, a physical product, and, and the copyright makes clear that you can own title to a physical piece of work, a CD, and do whatever you want with it. But the copyright, the intangible uh, content that's embodied on that CD is owned by an artist, is owned by a record company. And so what has changed here is not copyright, but rather how we distribute music. And so we, we now think of music as sort of this intangible uh, digital right. Uh, it is still the same content, we're just making things differently. And so that's the only thing that's changed. And to frame this issue, uh, I note uh, Ms. Hunt's quote talking about buying physical CDs and that she only had bought 15 but had a library of over 11,000 downloads that she never paid for. That's the distinction, I think, that sets up or frames the issue uh, from a copyright perspective. I mean, and is the distribution question that we're experiencing now that different from other periods where we would have a sort of disruptive technological event where you have you know, the advent of the player piano rolls or uh, vacuum tubes and radio and uh, phonographs and all that. There's always sort of a disruption and people kind of going, oh, what are we going to do and how are artists going to make money and everybody's going to be put out of business. What makes this period different from those other periods where there is a stabilization at a certain point? Sure, well, the, um, you know, the internet changed everything in terms of how we distribute music. That's just a fact of life. And, and you look at the, the amount of money generated, the, the, the market cap of Google, of all these companies, I mean, things have dramatically changed. And what we saw was the old brick and mortar businesses like record companies, publishing companies, film companies that distributed physical product not embrace the change. They actually resisted it. And they did not really figure out how to monetize the distribution of music and actually make money. And so what happened was technology just passed them by. And kids, you know, this 21-year-old Emily Hunt, um, that's just reality of what's happening. This is how kids are getting their music. Um, I was actually asked to be local counsel uh, by the recording industry on the Napster, like the, the download cases, um, and I, I decided not to do that. Number one, I represent artists. I'm an artist advocate. And so, it, you know, I'm generally a lot of times adverse to record companies. I sue record companies. I go after publishing companies on behalf of artists. Um, but second, I just thought, when you're suing your customer, you've got a problem. When you're not figuring out how to distribute and how to get paid for the music, something's wrong. And uh, I just did not agree with going after 15-year-old kids uh, and bringing lawsuits in federal district court. Um, and I, I would have been there in, in Duluth when this woman uh, lost her case. I think she got terrible advice, by the way, 
from her defense lawyer. But I just thought that's really not the way to do this. The way to do it is to figure out how to make money. And what we found is, um, and I, you, you could see this coming, is that technology companies filled in that void. And so, for example, Steve Jobs uh, and Apple stepped in and just set the standard. It's not a music company, it's a, a technology company, but they figured out how to monetize the distribution of music and just pass the record companies by. And so that's really the problem, uh, that how we make music, how we sell it, the companies themselves just didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something, Nancy? Yeah, I think to your question about what's different about this disruption between and, and previous disruptions, I'm not sure there's anything different, but I think if you look across the whole course of history, and you see this, I mean, I'm, I'm really a computer geek, that's where I got into all of this from. Um, there's something in computing technology called Moore's Law, which is a, a, a rule that um, the storage capacity and computing power of computers is going to in keep increasing exponentially. Um, but I think that's true of much technological change. And so while we've had lots of disruptive technologies before, um, you sort of said, why is this one not stabilizing? And I think it's actually, if you look over history, that the really disruptive technologies are getting closer and closer together. Mm. It's not really that things are not stabilizing, it's that they're changing much more quickly now. And, and so iTunes figured out how to sell downloads, mm -hmm. but people don't want downloads anymore. Right. right. But we're, we're wagging, this disruption is different because the, the same publishing companies that are very upset with how digital distribution is happening right now, and more, more importantly, the performing rights organizations that represent them, like BMI and ASCAP, were wagging their fingers at radio, you know, 70 years ago, and throughout a lot of the time saying, this is not going to work. The problem is that now, instead of wagging their fingers at technology companies, they're wagging their fingers at the equivalent of people who own a radio. We're just going after consumers as opposed to going after and trying to get a good agreement with Spotify, with Google, with iTunes. So I'm impressed with the companies that now are playing ball and you're seeing a whole bunch more catalogs appear on your Spotify every day because it is, I agree with you, Tim, it is really foolish. It's the equivalent of just in the 1950s yelling at everybody who buys an AM radio and going, what are you doing? How could you possibly be doing this? Mm -hmm. And it's going, this is how the game is played, so you should work with the people who are setting the rules, not the people who are taking the available technology. Sure. But where, where's the artist piece of that pie? I mean, that's, that's the problem. I mean, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. I mean, if you're an artist, and I feel like artists have kind of taken the attitude of, yeah, I can't sell it. I guess I'll just give it away in many cases. And that's always been true. I mean, people have always given away music. If you're, I mean, ever since I've been doing it anyway, you ended up giving away more of it than you ever ended up selling, or at least for a long time that was the case for me. And, uh, but, but now it's like you'll give it away and you will never sell it. You know, you'll, you'll never have any hope of selling it. And then it be, the, the question becomes, it's not like you're doing it to make money, but it's like the Grant, it's like the Grant Hart thing. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll say okay to downloading music when I can download a turkey sandwich or download my rent money. You know? And, and I, I read that quote um, in this press release, and the thing about that is it seems like Grant might have an issue with who's paying or how much he's getting paid, which those are both really reasonable issues to me, and there's no doubt that the pie has gone incredibly smaller. But when I look at somebody watching Seinfeld off of an antenna on NBC, I don't go, God, you thief. I'll, you know, I'll let you watch Seinfeld the day I can turn on an antenna and eat a sandwich. It, it's not the same. Like, I don't, they are monetizing that without you paying for it. You bought an antenna, right? You bought an antenna for $14.99, you bought a TV for $185 in 1985. Then you watch Seinfeld. You are not a thief. No, I, I agree. Yes, I think, that's, I think that's a good point. But the problem is, is that the, the structure, as far as I can tell at this point anyway, there, there is a stream of money that flows towards the companies that produce television shows. And as, as things stand right now, there is not a stream of the distribution networks for music uh, you know, um, back towards the artists. That's a, as things stand right now. I mean, all the all the YouTube money that's coming in, and I, all the all the ads that are on those sites. 
that all that money is flowing back up into whatever YouTube, YouTube is, now, is getting the money, and the artists are not getting yeah, the any of it at this none point. Of, none of that money is. I wanted to, to the get artists. a question That's though, and there's a question from the audience. Um, I can speak to the, the financial, I'll let the artists talk about the, the quality of the recordings. Um, what we're talking about in, in part is a bit of the tail wagging the dog in terms of technology sort of dictating how we're going to distribute music. At the end of the day, uh, Spotify is not going to help artists get paid more money, you know, having cloud uh, access and a subscription service. Um, give you an example, in, in 1965, a Beatles album cost $25. And that was really the model of record labels, sell an entire album for 25 bucks. Before then, it was a hit industry. We had the 45s, the singles, and then the album really allowed record companies to make a lot of money because they sold 12 songs, made you pay for the entire album. Now an album is what, $10.99, a song, 99 cents, older songs, 69 cents. Um, Spotify is in this to make money, not necessarily pay artists, and it's just shrinking the amount of money that artists are being paid. That's just the reality. Um, when a band like U2 releases an album and sells 400,000 units, I mean, something has dramatically shifted uh, in how kids purchase music, um, but more importantly, how we pay for music. Mm -hmm. And I just think that the subscription service model will just simply reduce the amount of money that goes to the creators uh, and line the pockets, and this was um, uh, the response to uh, Emily Hunt's article uh, Lowry uh, wrote about, you know, look, look at what the technology companies are doing. They're making a lot of money, billions of dollars, um, and they're not doing it to, uh, you know, as an altruistic means of paying artists. They're just not. Nancy, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I actually agree that the, the subscription services are not going to get more money to artists. Part of that is not just due, I, certainly technology companies are now taking a piece of the pie, although I don't think that YouTube is making quite as much money off of YouTube videos as people may think they are. Um, but part of the challenge with the subscription services is that record companies are lobbying very hard for payments to go to the record companies, which, as you said, John, there's money flowing through all of these new distribution mechanisms. Um, and the folks who own the copyrights, who are quite frequently not the artists who made the music in the first place, are the ones who are lobbying hard for how the technologies will work just in terms of contracts between the record companies and the streaming services or, or whatever. And they're also lobbying for legislative rules and uh, administrative policy rules that favor themselves. They're favor, you know, they're the big, uh, they have the, the big voice in Washington. Artists don't really have a big voice in Washington. And while record companies are essential in some, in some forms of distribution to getting artists paid, um, one of the things that's a challenge to getting artists paid right now in some of the new technologies are actually the record companies. Just one quick comment. Um, the two <laughs> Stanford grads that created YouTube sold it to Google for $1.67 billion. They're like 26-year-olds. I think they each walked away with $425 million. Um, now, YouTube creates a whole other issue of, of what's free, uh, what qualifies under the uh, safe harbor protection for internet service providers under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, and they actually, I was actually asked to look at that case because the, the movie studio sued uh, YouTube and Google saying you're, you're infringing our copyrights. You can go online and pull a video or a movie, anything you want, and YouTube said, oh, we're just a bulletin board. We, we, you know, people put this up, we don't monitor it, not true. They were actually creating the library, you could embed it to your own site, et cetera. And so at the end of the day, the, the key players in internet, in the industry, wherever content is distributed, are the Googles, the uh, iTunes, the Spotify's, they control the debate, they control the money. But that's why the publishers have to catch up with them and start extracting funds and redirecting the flow of that cash. I mean, to, to the artists and the, to the people who create it and the other copyright owners. I mean, yeah, Nancy, you're totally right. It, it, it is true that um, 
that a lot of a lot of copyrights end up going into some big publishing house. But you know, um, you know, for a long time, artists can own those copyrights and do, and and it, it it's 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 not insignificant. I mean, I'm I I get money from a song that I, I you know was a partner on um, and I get I get that money every quarter and it makes my life much easier and better it's not like it's a huge sum of money but it is this songwriting royalty and you know I don't know that that money is necessarily going to be as available for those of you in this room who are songwriters as it was to me when you know that closing time was a hit you know, that is, is money that, you know, I'm hoping that even my kids might benefit from down the line, you know. Um, it, just the pure financial part of PRO distribution, so what BMI and ASCAP are sending out, is increasing. What BMI and ASCAP are sending out, they're sending out more money than they were some years ago. That's not to say the industry is healthy, and that's also not to say that the infrastructure that permitted, is anybody not familiar with the amazing song, Closing Time, that John had a role in writing? If you don't know it, I mean, you haven't lived. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, and it's though. gotten, you know, it, it, it continues to sort of run into the cultural, you know, it's placed in a movie again, or it gets yeah, played again, right. so it's sort of a nice little cash cow that will hopefully for some time be there for you, but... Oh, and, and it's, and, Please. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's, the thing I'm saying is that it, that song, there might never be the infrastructure around in 15 years for songs, single songs, to have that level of influence, where people are going to go, we got to put this on a movie, we got to do this, this is still a culture... You know, if you want to have a girl in 1996 driving in her car, you're going to want closing time and you're gonna pay for the rights for it. It's true, you know what I mean? Like it, you are so right, Sean. <laughs> it captures the moment. But the, the only deal is that now, you know, 40 years from now, how many options are we gonna have to capture that moment? There's way more music that's hitting youth folks. There's way less shared experiences based on that. But the, the, the reason I started talking into this microphone a minute ago was to say that there isn't a lot business-wise that's not gonna say that all these subscription services might help those BMI and ASCAP checks, because somebody might not go buy Feeling Strangely Fine for 12 bucks, but somebody might go, what's that? Okay, and hit it, and yeah. listen to it once. And they have to listen to it like 244 times to equal, to equal the actual download. There's a question back there I wanted to get to. I think I have a, a great example uh, for this question. It's Adam Young from Owatonna, Owl City, uh, who I've worked with, um, who used the internet to generate interest. And he had a song called Hello Seattle that, that had like six million hits. It went viral. And, and so that's something he never could have done without the internet. And what happened and what you'll see in that situation um, Universal Records, Universal Music Group, the biggest record company in the world, saw that and they saw commerce and they signed him and they said, you need a lawyer, hire, hire these guys, which was a great referral for us. But it underscores, um, you know, when, when people talk about doom and gloom in the music industry, I actually think it's a really amazing time as well because the door is opened to self-publishing and self-releasing. Um, you know, John, you can comment on what it took to make, uh, you know, a major label release album, the amount of money spent, hundreds of thousands of dollars 10, 15 years ago. Now, you know, I mean, this kid, Adam Young, he's 23, did it in his parents' basement mm. in Owatonna, um, and then followed it up with Fireflies, number one hit in 23 countries. Um, he's set for life. I do want to comment on the publishing, just a little background. Um, in music, you have two copyrights. One is a song, you think of sheet music, and so when, when John talks about writing closing time, he's talking about his publishing interest. And then you have a recording of a song, that's the sound recording copyright, which is a derivative work of the song. So for example, Unchained Melody, I think has been recorded and charted like 12 times. One person wrote it, the Righteous Brothers made it famous. And so there is a distinction between 
money going to songwriters, which the publishing companies have done a very good job uh, collecting that revenue. You know, basically have ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC that collect, and it's one of the copyrights, the public performance right. They collect radio, terrestrial, internet. Uh, they collect television, any public performance, venues. Um, I represent Martin Zeller of the Gear Daddies, and he wrote the Zamboni song, and we go into you know, hockey arenas to collect that money. And so the publishing side, the songwriting side, uh, has not been hit as hard as the sound recording side where nobody's making money. Mm. Question um, here. Sorry, can I still to the original question? That sure, we'll get to your question in a second. Asked. Go ahead, Nancy. Just um, because the response thus far has been about using um, you know, within the, the system that it involves eventually getting signed to a major label, um, it is true that I, I think you were asking about middlemen. Um, I think there are some artists who, who would, would need the middleman to be largely commercially successful. Um, a really good example of somebody who worked through a system involving middlemen and then kind of struck out on his own is Louis C.K., whose, whose latest album downloads scored him millions. But that was after he got famous. Um, and there are artists who will never, you know, who, who need that boost to get there. Um, and there are some artists, and this is something I find extremely exciting about the new technologies of distribution. So there are some artists who are making money enough to live on or enough to uh, you know, supplement other income streams that they don't want more money by connecting directly with their fans. And I think that's an exciting new opportunity. Um, and it's really hard to see, you know, I think part of the, the challenge to where the structures are going to be in 20 years is you know, if we disintermediate a lot, um, then do ASCAP and CSAC and BMI, um, you know, the, the artists who never signed with a label, how do they get their publishing royalties in 20 years? But I think it's really exciting that there are new opportunities to reach audiences without the middle person. And money, yeah. money can be made. We're not saying this is the end of money making in, in the industry, we're just saying that this has shifted dramatically. You had a question? You know, Spotify is a subscription model, and you have to be licensed. They have to have a license. And so, and I think the, the point of this uh, discussion, the, the overarching point, is this culture of free versus paid for. And, and so I would put that in the category of legal. Uh, it's just not beneficial to the artist. Um, you know, the, the Emily, and I said Hunt, I think her name is Emily. White. Uh, White. 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 Um, what she was talking about is that culture of young kids that don't pay for music. I mean, when I traveled or, you know, especially when in the early 2000 decade, you talk to a kid and say, what albums are you buying? And they'd say, I don't buy albums. And I don't even pay for songs. They were all taking it free. And that really was the problem um, created, I think, by the record label's failure to understand where this was going. Okay, so again, the only thing that changes is how we buy music or how we get it, how it's distributed. Um, but sp the Spotify example, I think, is just a f further squeezing of artist income. It just is. I, do you really think? I, I, do you really think that? I mean, I think you're right that the record companies were way behind the ball. I mean, I, uh, they they certainly could have been Apple, or they should have been so smart, because once you have a digital copy, you can copy that as many times as you want to if you've got the technology to do it, which everybody in this room and pretty much seems like uh, many, many people have, and that's why we have this problem. But my thought is, is once you've got a digital copy of a song, you know, could the, could the record companies have put a cork in that in any way? I just, I'm, I'm very skeptical. I mean, they tried uh, encoding the music and mm -hmm. making it uncopyable and Tethered all these, downloads yeah, and all this stuff, stuff yeah. different stuff. I just think once, once you're making digital reproductions of art, you've gone through the looking glass and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, Anybody can do it, basically. I, I mean, the record companies, yeah, they were behind, but the outcome would have been the same. Well, if we look at who owns the major labels, um, uh, Universal, Vivendi, okay, a French water company, Capital EMI, uh, Seagram's, a, a liquor distributor at, at its core.
core. Sony, an electronics manufacturer, you'd think they'd get it. Um, and, and Warner Brothers, which was really the only true record label. Um, it, the, the industry itself changed dramatically. In the 60s, there were 35 major labels producing all kinds of wonderful music. And then we went through massive conglomeration, um, and I think actually uh, stifling of music, you know, where it was to the least common denominator. And I just think that they kind of lost what they had in the 60s and 70s. And then with respect to the internet, just didn't even, you know, I heard uh, the general counsel of Lucasfilm talk about uh, infringement and what they, what they saw. They used to go after any infringer of the Star Wars uh, franchise really aggressively. But then what they discovered is they were actually losing money. And they did a complete 180 and said, you know what, why don't you take our stuff? We'll have a contest for a Star Wars movie. We'll pay money. And they, they saw their franchise go up dramatically, the merchandising and so on. And I just think if you get to a point where you have to sue your customer to pay for what you're producing, the bigger issue is how do we get them to pay? Because mm -hmm. you've lost if you're doing that, I think. Mm. Rebecca. Go ahead, Sean. from subscription services. Well, or from YouTube, I mean, which is not a subscription-based service. I think, I think the reality is that there's infrastructures that are now largely useless at a lot of these companies. Mm -hmm. And for those folks who want to maintain that basic operating model, which is based upon a very expensive method of distributing music, Anybody who wants to keep all those people in their offices and keep going, who's our guy in Atlanta? He's got to go you know, work the streets and put up the posters. Anybody who thinks that they want to waste some of their money on that is, is never going to be able to monetize the trickle that comes through properly. It, it, it's not going to work. This infrastructure is, has been hollow for a long time because I never, I never signed with a major label, but I signed with Razor and Tie, which is like a smaller label that was distributed by Sony BMG. And even then they were going... Well, we got a publicity guy, but he's not right for you guys. We're going we're gonna to hire an outside person. We got a radio guy, but they're not right for you guys. So they got all these people drawing a salary every year, and they're using completely different people because they hired a rap act. And it's all, I mean, it's just it's profound wastes of money. For those people who run it lean, and for those people who run, ran it lean from the beginning, and there's less people putting their hand on your part, it's the the numbers aren't as bad and I don't you know when I see Justin Bieber making thirty thousand dollars off of Spotify I'm not tripping when I think about what he's making off of performances off of what he's making just in his BMI checks which he's also seeing from those Spotify pays beyond what Spotify pays for to him or excuse me to his label which I believe is universal so it's just if, if you take the pulse of any one part of this it's ugly and if you run any one part of it through a company like Universal, unless you're selling Bieber numbers, you're screwed. But if you don't have that foolish and wasteful infrastructure, the trickle looks a little more like a stream. And if you tore, the stream looks a little more like a river. You know, and it's, it's possible. Right. And, and just to clarify again, the performance income goes to the songwriter, not the artist. In Europe, there is a, a, a performance right for artists, and we have the digital performance right, which was added. but the primary income from public performance goes to the songwriter. So be the writer. There's still money to be made. <laughs> That's just I the way it is. Just an, uh, it, thinking about ways things might stabilize that provide revenues to artists, um, one thing that's interesting, I don't know that this works for everybody, um, but it certainly has worked for some people, is you know we're talking about the, the really what record companies did for a long time somewhat more successfully than others was try to lock down the digital files. This gets back to your, is there a way to ever have digital files that, that people pay for? Um, locking them down doesn't seem to work very well, although if you do it so that it works seamlessly, that works a little better for consumers. Um, but something that some people are doing that's working for them is giving away the digital files. Here, pay what you want. When you let people pay what they want, sometimes you get more per album 
than you were getting before you had pay what you want. I mean, this is, you can go and look at artists who've experimented with pay what you want. Some of them don't see an increase. Some of them see significant increases over how much they were getting before. And this is people who, who are running it themselves. You know, we I mean, we're asking people to pay five bucks an album. When we do pay what we want, the average is 750. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, I'm curious Funny. to know Radiohead did that within Rainbows mm -hmm. and I never heard a, a final dollar amount or a comparative one between any of their previous records if it was actually a successful financial strategy for them in terms of income. I don't know about Radiohead, but people are, um, one of the interesting things people have been playing with lately, um, and this is actually a charity effort, so there's maybe other things going on too, but there's something called the Humble Bundle, and they've done it with uh, video games, music, and eBooks at this point, and they're coming up with new techniques to get people to pay more. I actually have a friend who told me straight up he paid 13 cents for the Humble Bundle of video games. The money goes to children's charities for kids in hospitals to have video games to play, and he paid 13 cents. And I was just like, you, sir, are just a jerk, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. But one of the things the Humble Bundle has, has done in the last couple of bundles they've put out is pay what you want, including 13 cents, my jerky friend, um, but if you pay more than average, you get this extra stuff. And suddenly people are averaging eight, 10, $15 a bundle. So I think there are some new ways to monetize, some new ways to get to revenue streams. And as Sean was saying, the, the, the large infrastructures of the past don't help any of that. But where you have lean, um, where you have really creative and strategic uh, approaches to getting new ways to get money, sometimes just asking people to give you money if they feel good about you gets you some. But isn't it interesting that, you know, we're only talking about this with music. I mean, what about film and video games and so on? I mean, these companies are not having the problem that music is having. And the reason why is because of simple bandwidth. You know, the ability to download a song, boom. You could have 800,000 people own this song. Remember the days downloading a movie it took like a half an hour or whatever? I mean, it's just too cumbersome. Um, and that's changing. But they've, the, the studios, the movie studios have really figured out, I think, learning from music, okay, this is how we do it. And so we've got Netflix and internet and everything's controlled and streamed and you can have the right to watch a movie for one month and then it disappears. It's like the, you know, the, the disappearing or tethered download type thing. And, and so for me, the reality is simply, it's all just content, music, was the sort of the first casualty mm -hmm. and then all the other content owners learned from that experience and are figuring out how to monetize the sale of their product. Um, when we talk about you know different ideas uh, of how to give away music or how to do this, um, what that underscores for me is that the genie is out of the bottle and you cannot put it back in. Okay, we're climbing, we're going backwards to try to figure that out. On the so I will pay for a turkey sandwich until I can download it. Right? So right now you still got to pay for a movie right at first. John, but you've been characteristically or uncharacter uncharacteristically quiet today. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here because I know you've got some very strongly held beliefs and I think you and I share some of them. Um, I'm it, learning a lot. Yeah. Uh, um, both of us had opportunities to kind of see the big <clears throat> record industry um, the sort of fat that was there and the money and, and all of the possibilities. And we kind of grew up in a time when this notion of a body of work that you would create, the body of work that an artist creates is hopefully, at least in our mindset, was something that was going to create sustenance for a period of time. And I think that's a decreasing sort of vision about body. Body of work has other significance creatively for people, mm. but I think a lot of young artists don't see it in the same way that you and I do. And when you say recording costs money... I think you don't, you can't, you can't see it that way when you're a young artist. I mean, the, the job of every young artist in the room right now is to, is to create that body of work, right? I mean, that's, that's what you guys are doing. It's very hard to... It's hard when you're 21 or 22 or whatever to think out in the in terms of a long-term vision for your future. But if you're committed to being an artist, there's consequences to not thinking a little bit about 
what it is that you're doing and, and how it's all gonna kind of add up at the end of the day. Um, and I remember, you know, I did one band that did really well and, and, um, and then the band broke up and it was kind of, you know, the band had been broken up for a, a few months and whatever money had been flowing from, you know, the touring and, and record making and stuff that we had done, that dried up and then I was standing there and I was like, okay, I was a bass player in a band and now I am wondering about how I'm going to make a dollar somewhere in this world. And, uh, and the idea of like, I mean, I, I entertained every possibility and I was calling up people and I was like, hey man, you know, I'd come work down at the record store or, you know, work at the music shop or something like that. And there wasn't a gig and it got, I got very freaked out. Um, and I vowed that it, whatever I was gonna pour my time into, I was not going to be standing at the end of that time that I'd poured in going with empty empty pockets and empty hands, you know? And so when I um, partnered up with the next group of guys that I partnered up with, not being a songwriter, I was like, I'm not, I, I want to do this and I will throw my back into it and I will push so hard and I will do everything. But if I can't participate in the songwriting piece, I'll go find somebody who will let me participate in the songwriting piece because I knew that that was where the long run was. And, and that is uh, proven to be one of the best decisions that I ever made. And I think it, you, know, you need to value yourself in that way. Uh, and if you can find people who will, sh if you're not a writer, if you can find people who are writers who value your artistry and want you involved in their project, you should find a way to participate in the songwriting because as these guys have all pointed out, songwriting is where the money is in music. Um, and, and to the extent that you are a songwriter, congratulations, that's awesome. And to the extent you're not a songwriter, find a songwriter mm. and associate yourself as closely as you possibly can with that person and become indispensable to them. Uh, Question here. I would say absolutely not. Um, the definition of a copyright is an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. In my opinion, the fact that it's in the digital realm is still a medium of expression. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. I mean, the internet at its inception has always been thought of as kind of the wild, wild web. You know, you can get anything and it's all free and look at all this information, all this content. That's the problem, is the perception that if it's on the internet, it's free, okay? And I think that, um, you know, kind of flows into that or is, you know, your, your comment dovetails that sentiment that it's really not something you can touch or feel because it's not physical. Um, under copyright, there's a distinction between a physical object and the intangible copyright. If I create a painting and sell it to you, you own that physical object. I, as the artist, own the right to copy it. I always retain that. And that's what we're really talking about, is these intangible rights, not the actual thing. I want to make sure that students get some opportunities here. We can do a couple more questions from students. Definitely. Um, the, the, you just look at pure numbers. When I was younger, you know, an album, I mean, I didn't buy this, but Michael Jackson, 25 million, Thriller. Um, Hootie and the Blowfish, 16 million copies. Alanis said 16 million copies. You know, the hit album sold a lot of money, and that was the old model for record labels. Um, interesting fact, I think it's, at that time, like 90% of all major label releases sold less than 10,000 units, okay? And they'd spend a half a million or a million dollars on every single one. They'd finance it with the hits, the ones that sold 25 million. Well, that's not the case anymore. I think last year the biggest selling album was 3 million, uh, Adele. I mean, it's, it's done.
I mean, in terms of, I would just take issue with that, though, only because there's so many independent artists who are creating bodies of work, like an album is still a valuable thing to a lot of indie artists. They want to create cohesive work. Whether we have the same sorts of numbers that generate the sort of revenue that we had before, that's not a measurable way to look at it. And I think Sean kind of hit on the fact that we're really living in a time where we can't look at music consumption in the same way. We are such a divided audience. Tastes are more splintered and hybridized than at any point in history. So sometimes making these grand statements about how we're consuming isn't fair because we're, we're, there's so much more music now. And there are so many more sort of subgenres and, and consumers at any point. What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say um, that is correct. An album is an art form, and I agree with that completely. It's just what consumers are doing is buying songs, which I think actually harkens back to the old days mm -hmm. when people bought 45s. I mean, it, we're back to kind of the hit industry that it used to be. I mean, it was really the Beatles and Pink Floyd and so on that made these concept albums. Um, so I, I agree as an artist representative, absolutely. The Question. medium, the digital download medium also does not accommodate the I idea of downloading an album, I don't think. It's, right. it's, a more, it's more cumbersome, it's bigger, it's longer, it takes up more space. It's harder to get yourself onto that project of like, I guess I'm going to pop for the 10 bucks to get you know, all 12 of these songs and I'll get somewhat less than the 99 cents per song, even though the one song that I really want to hear is this, the hit or whatever particular song it is on the record. But to me, artistically speaking, um, albums are, are awesome. You know, it's a, having this document of a period of time of an artist's work is, it, it, it gives you some nuance to whatever their vision is that you can't get from just a single song. Question in back there, you. Make good albums. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, also, I, have, I have one comment about that, which is some of the some of the actual market use data suggests that this lack of attention span is somewhat fictionalized. Now, obviously, there's tons of people who go and buy tracks, but New York Times did an audit of their readership, and their ten most read articles were all over three thousand words, right? Which is very very long for a newspaper article, and in the same way. I believe that iTunes album sales still looked somewhat healthier than their single sales until recently. I'm saying until recently, I mean like two years ago and things sure. like this. So the, the, uh, it, a couple, maybe four years ago, Bob Mould was up on this stage talking about a whole bunch of things about making records. And he said, the art form of the record is still about 30 to 45 minutes of music, which is basically the shortest Beatles record to the longest Beatles record. And we surpassed that as a technical limitation, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago when CDRs be or CDs became 75 minutes long. So the idea that somehow tracking the art form, um, competing with technology, that, that separation happened a long time ago. People still care about your 30 to 45 minute statement. The other thing is that one of the things that works in the favor of young artists is that you still won't get reviews without a full length mm -hmm. record. And reviews still matter. Press still matters. Right. And the fact is that even if somebody is putting your whole album up for free on their blog, they might be more likely to do that than a single song. So for a journalist to have the opportunity to critique a body of work, I think it's a lot easier to write a 400 word article about 45 minutes of music than about Let's a get song. a question That's back there. Thank you, Sean. That's, a, that's, a, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I remember when I was coming up, the idea of like um, selling a song to a commercial interest for exploitation of some, uh, you know, uh, to sell some kind of pro product was repugnant and repulsive to me. Um, and, I, and it's been a long time to kind of get over that fact because it like one of the only ways you can make money right now is placements and I think right. what everybody is fighting for right now is placements and in fact I'm working on producing a record right now where the manager of the artist was very explicit and said you know you got to make sure that you don't get 
vocal you know tracks onto the music mix because we can probably sell the music mix as a standalone project uh, product for underscoring of a commercial or a movie and I was like what are we making <laughs> are we making our am I making underscoring for a, a television commercial because it's really not going to be that kind of record or am I making an album you know which I'm that's the thing that I'm actually interested in doing so I think that's a that's a real a question artists have to ask themselves right now is how do you create uh, added value without feeling exploited in some way? I think that's actually a perennial question for artists in every medium, is how do I create something that has artistic integrity, that, that conveys my vision as an artist? How do I do that? How do I do that and make a living? How do I do that and avoid entering into relationships that I don't want to be in. I mean, it's not unique to music, it's not unique to now. That's, mm. that's a constant question in art, I think. I think we got time for one more question. I saw one over here. The, the lawyers are looking at each other. Well, who, I, I was looking uh, to see if Nancy wanted well, to there's, take it. It's two there's that when questions. is it changed completely? Yeah, that's yeah. two hugely different questions because the, I mean, the basic issue is that for, for a recorded cover version, there's a statutory license um, that you pay a certain amount. And, and yeah, the, the original songwriter makes money off of it. Sometimes the person who recorded it makes money off of it too. Um, but then there's the question of when do you, when have you completely changed it? And a really interesting case, which is probably in your mind as well, is when Two Live Crew recorded Roy Orbison's <laughs> Pretty Woman, which is a Supreme Court case about derivative works. Um, they, it's, if you listen to it, it is the same song in a slightly different genre, but they changed the words. Roy Orbison's estate denied them permission, and then the Supreme Court said, this is fair use. Even though it's commercial, even though it's substantially the same. Um, so when do you get to a whole new work? That's a really challenging question. Yeah, but I'll go, I, I was just going to explain that the statute, Section 115 of the Copyright Act, says that the moment somebody commercially releases a song in the United States, anybody else has the absolute right to cover it. Okay, that's the rule. Um, you have to pay a royalty. It's currently 9.1 cents up to five minutes recorded song per album or song sold, um, so long as you don't change the fundamental melody and lyric of the work. Now, what does that mean? Um, in the Two Live Crew, it was clearly not a cover um, because they said, you know, big hairy woman, you know, and saying, look, if a, a woman walking down the street in our hood, you know, looks like that, it's something different. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is the Supreme Court said um, they were talking about social commentary in that song, which I thought was rather interesting because I thought the album sucked. But they sold four million copies because of all the controversy, you know, mm -hmm. Luther Campbell um, mm -hmm. being banned, you know, and I mean, I had friends whose father bought this album because they're like, what are they telling me I can't hear? Um, but, but that's, so if you change the lyric dramatically, you do not have a right to do that. You must seek permission. Mm -hmm. Love you guys for coming. I want to thank David Lewis for putting this on. I want to thank our guests, Nancy, Sean, Tim, and John. I'm Harry Shalmiers. I'm the president of McNally Smith College of Music. We had a few follow-up questions after that very interesting panel discussion at the college on the kind of creative new music industry. And so I just want to follow up. Anybody can jump in. But Tim, you had said something. I don't remember exactly the quote, but it had to do with the fact that though the old industry was certainly changing and there was a lot of people lamenting and it was, it's painful to a lot of people. Right. You said that this is a time of tremendous opportunity. Would you elaborate on that part of things? Sure, happy to. So one of the things we talked about was uh, how artists are able to promote themselves and publish and do things online. And I gave an example of our client Owl City, Adam Young. 
Uh, everything he did was because of the internet, or his success at the inception was because of the internet. And so um, even though record labels are struggling, even though we're having difficulty collecting digital royalties and paying uh, monies that should be due, we've also opened up this whole new platform for artists to promote and distribute and sell their own music and to self-publish. And so um, on the one hand, there's some problems, but on the other hand, I do think there's a lot of opportunity going forward. And John, I know, you know we've had a little bit of exchange. You're a guy that's had, spent your entire life doing a ton of great music and drawing some income from it and something that you hope to continue to support you almost like part of a retirement plan and maybe even <laughs> Help, you know, I mean, not quite in yet. the distant future. <laughs> in the, but, and you even said it would maybe help your kids with income. And now you're looking at maybe a situation where it's not going to be what you had hoped. Is, is that right? Well, I, 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 think, um, I think about myself, of course, and I am the most important person to me. Uh, but, but I think about all the other artists, too. And I think of Adam Young and All City as being a little bit of an outlier. Yeah. Um, you know, I think he is. Uh, um, he, he's the exception, you know, maybe not the exception that proves the rule, but I think generally speaking, yes, there's a lot of opportunity out there for artists to reach directly uh, to their fans right now. But if the fans are kind of have an expectation of getting the music for free, um, I just wonder how young artists are going to kind of be able to continue in music. I think that that is really the problem. For me, you know, um, there was some publishing money that kind of accrued and is a, there's a little bit of a stream, but you know, it takes years of kind of selling stuff and kind of building a career. And I just, the, in the early going, you have to have something to start making that pile, you know? And I just wonder how artists are doing that now. Well, let me make a statement about this and then anybody that feels like commenting, tell me what you think about it. But I, I wonder if, you know, in the old model, there were, statistically speaking, so very, very few musicians actually reached the level of success that you have attained, but very few that really made that money, and a lot of them made a killing. And I sometimes say, I wonder if in the future fewer are going to make a killing, but a lot more people might make a life. Mm. You know, mm. just on a small scale, on a local scale, is that, is that realistic? Is that a possibility? And is that something to look forward to? I have a couple comments about that. One thing that Tim brought up during the discussion that I haven't talked about publicly is that when those folks made a killing, so when Semisonic recoups on top of what they got paid, that actually, a lot of that money funded a lot of failures, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So the, on the occasional successes that pulled in millions of dollars of revenue, that funded lots of failures, lots of failures that a lot of us have also been parts of. The, the thing about that is that now, the people who still make a killing in the digital age, so a Lady Gaga, um, a lot of these folks, they aren't funding as many failures. Right. Failures are funding themselves. Failures have kickstarts and success stories have kickstarters. Mm -hmm. But these, these big revenue folks, it's not, it's not feeding back in unless they decide to do that themselves with their own money. And that's a little bit of a bummer as much as I think the, it was a completely atrophied system and is a huge waste there is this sense in which it did fund exploration, granted at the whimsy of an A&R guy who had no idea, as opposed to an A&R guy who does research, who goes, oh, Owl Cities has six million heads, let's go cash in on him, right. and he comes to the table and can actually demand something. But it's, it's still <laughs> that funding is not flowing through the same way. That's mm -hmm. right. And I would agree he's an outlier, um, but I think the good news is the appetite for music in our culture and across the globe is as great as ever. People are listening to music, kids are downloading songs, um, the, the exporting of our intellectual property is as high as ever. The issue is just how do we get people to pay uh, a reasonable fee for that content? That's the problem. The appetite, the demand, it's there. Now I asked a question in the auditorium about Spotify and if, you know, or, or whatever the next level is of cloud delivery, is it not, you, you disagree that it would be possible that when everybody is subscribing to that at even perhaps an elevated rate, that that money is still not going to get back as royalties to the artist. 
But I, I guess I still don't understand quite why, if there's enough of a subscriber base at a sufficient level, and somebody along the way says, to do this right, artists have got to get their cut. You know, whether it's the mechanical rights agency, or, you know, ASCAP, or somebody that makes a new deal, and there's a bigger pie, right. that, that won't work. I think one of the things that we were talking about, although not all that directly in, in the earlier session, was that the, the pie of those streaming services involves more actors, and some of them um, are tech industry that weren't really involved in previous record sales. It does involve, um, a lot of the time, rec record companies, dist distribution companies, some of whom are more efficient than others. Um, so it may be that the pie is getting bigger, but there's more people taking chunks. From my perspective, there's also a challenge in terms of the statutory royalty schemes. Um, radio, people make money off of being played on the radio because the statutory fee for radio play is a certain amount. The statutory fee for internet play is a different amount. Um, and what percentage goes back to the artists is different in both cases as well. The, um, the internet companies were quite active in lobbying against ra raising the fee for the internet plays partly because they, they want to get some money. But it's also true that the record companies take a big cut of either one of those royalties. And not many people, record companies or tech companies, are advocating for increasing the artist's cut of either one of those royalty streams. And that's one of the big challenges to whether artists are ever going to, the artists are ever going to see. And, and here's another problem that we've had in the United States, whereas Europe and other jurisdictions have done better, is deciding what rights are actually impacted by a stream, by a download. And so you have Harry Fox Agency, which governs mechanical royalties, do songwriters for digital sales, and then ASCAP and BMI, which is performance, performance right income for songwriters, fighting over what exactly is the right that should should generate the money and so if you have a subscription service where it, it is essentially you can listen to any song you want but it's not a download is that more like radio which would go to the songwriter as opposed to a digital sale which goes to the artist and unfortunately our industry has fought at the copyright tribunal and with each other over who gets the money instead of like they do in Europe giving a unified right and, and working this out. Mm -hmm. This may be a difficult question, or I have a concept, I don't know if I can phrase it right, but it seems to me that there are really two very different problems that are, we're discussing. And one is, what do we do about the people like Adam Levy and John and others? Adam's written a lot of songs, has money coming in from some of those songs. We've talked about John. And how do we deal with that going forward, as the old model is changing so dramatically? But as the head of a music school, that's trying to prepare young students today to go out and be able to make a life in music. Isn't it true that there are, it's a whole different world in how we prepare them for what's gonna be happening five to 15 to 50 years down the road? In a certain sense, I mean, I don't mean to be insensitive, but I'm less concerned with how we solve the first problem and more concerned with what do we teach people is there a possibility that, you know, in five years, 15, whatever, there aren't record labels at all? There's just a whole different way of the grassroots artists, maybe even banding together. I mean, I'm a child of the 60s and figuring out a way to where the people come together and make something happen that works for the artists. And they can create that. And the, if the Internet is democratizing you know, some aspects, providing opportunities for the people, you know, as we, wikis and all kinds of examples. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a question in here somewhere. Mm, I, I, I think that for, for artists who um, are really interested in, in doing business, um, this new internet age is a, a huge opportunity because you can really fashion your own business out of it. It's like raw material to kind of create your own distribution model, create a way to interact with your fans that's novel and really cool. But I think there's a whole world of artists out there who are not that interested in, in uh, 
creating a business model. They're interested in interacting with a business model that can help them further their artistic dreams. And I feel like the intersection of those two worlds is a real difficulty for a lot of musicians that I know. They find it very, very royally waters to navigate in terms of how do I make this thing that I'm so passionate about and care about so much available in this new world where maybe I put it out there and I'll never see anything back for it. And I think your idea of like some kind of a, some kind of a, a cooperative um, is, is ultimately gonna be a model that could work for a lot of people. Because I think there's a lot of people who are really interested in music business. I mean, I think your school has got a lot of students, that's, the, that's their area of focus. And I think if you can get those music business people thinking about ways to serve artists and to try and generate streams of revenue to help those artists, then maybe we'll have our solution, you know? Yeah. And as far as 50 years down the road, God knows. But, you know, but maybe this could be something that could work in the next right. five years. That's very well put, and I really agree. I can relate to what you just said. But something that we do talk about at the school, you know, the DIY, everybody, you know, do it yourself. I, mean, I prefer to replace with DIT, do it together. Mm. Start building your collective. When you're a student at the school, find your favorite business people and recording and technology people and start now making little collectives that work together to try to, maybe it's utopian vision, but it just seems like there's opportunity there. Well, there's an old saying that nature abhors a vacuum, okay? And we know the record labels are having, I mean, I have friends, they're losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're shrinking and ultimately will have serious problems staying afloat. And the old model of record labels signing an artist like John and paying him in advance to go create the music, and so he just has to be concerned about the music, um, those days are over. They're not offering the multi-million dollar deals. Uh, the Adam Young example, he actually had commerce uh, that they could uh, make money off of and they knew that going in they're not taking risk anymore on breaking new acts and so that model is gone and how we break acts how people become popular um, there's going to be something filling that void I don't know what it's going to be but maybe your idea would help I follow a lot of artists on Twitter who are talking about these issues and actually some of the people I find most interested in um, engaging. I mean, we talk about, in the Twin Cities music scene, we talk about Jerry, Jeremy Messersmith as an artist who's exploring new avenues. Um, but some of the people that I see on Twitter who are talking about some kinds of collective action, both on ownership and making business profits, but also in terms of justice, social justice issues related mm -hmm. to who's getting paid, what the music is about, um, Shockley, which is part of the, the group that worked with Public Enemy, um, Chuck D. There's some really interesting discussions going on about how collective, you know, how musicians working together can maybe solve some of the business problems in the industry, but also may solve, um, may be able to address some of the um, questions that, that come up in the topics of music about how the world works um, and, and social justice issues that way. That's great. I'm glad you're gonna. Uh, unfortunately, I guess that means I can't copyright the idea. It's my idea and make money off that. I, I think you a, thought of it first. Uh, <laughs> you, you can think Ideas of it first, but then somebody can take it and make it a copyright by uh, putting it to paper. Um, I just want to yeah. follow up on that. Um, you, you see this with environmental issues. A lot of artists, um, and I have a client, Music Matters, in town that promotes uh, green touring, and you know all these bands are getting involved in that. Uh, because it's it's good business mm -hmm. and it's you know social justice is in a form marketing like hey we care about these issues mm -hmm. and so that um, could be a, a definitely a combination where bands have a common goal uh, and that also sells records mm -hmm. we change the subject kind of entirely but follow up on an earlier conversation that um, had to do with a couple of things, but you mentioned, Tim, that movies, as one example, are not having as much the problem just because of bandwidth, the problem of illegal downloads and ubiquitous access and so on. But I had mentioned in one of my questions that what bums me out no end is that the quality of what I and pretty much everybody else, the way people listen to music today, 
is that it really diminished quality, speaking of bandwidth. And people were downloading songs so quickly because they're compressed and they're nowhere near the full sonic range. Is there an opportunity or is it past to have, I mean, when I think of Spotify or other streaming services, I wish they would go back to the full glorious full sound out of a recording studio that is a lot more information. Thank you, John. <laughs> You're talking and, analog. Yeah, I mean, essentially, yeah, that's a bigger file, which yeah. in turn makes it more difficult mm -hmm. for people to pirate right. and gives other opportunities, but most importantly, gives people the full sound of the, you know, because what we listen to now just sucks. And well, there's lots of, I mean, the, the, the sort of explosion of vinyl amongst young artists is all, is a lot of it is about sonic quality, the way people are mastering records is shifting. There's been a period where gain structure on records was just insane and spiraling. And, and a lot of people, younger artists that are putting vinyl out are concerned about that. I think by and large though, most consumers are concerned about convenience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for those that really care about sound, they're the ones that get the phonograph and they support the people with vinyl. The vinyl thing's interesting too, just because it sort of gets to that issue of artists being able to produce an artifact that is additional, you know, for lack of a better expression, value added to the music, which may not have the sort of financial currency that it once had. Yeah, yeah the, the uh, I mean, it, with vinyl, or actually with any of this stuff that you're talking about, there's like the, the need for hi-fi, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of an antiquated concept right. for most people. I think, I, you know, I was, I was listening to some mixes that I'd worked on recently, and, um, you know, they sounded great in the studio. I was very pleased with them. I brought them home and I listened to them on my computer and I was like, yeah, this is not going to pass muster. I think a lot of engineer, mix engineers right now are mixing for whatever Digital. is in that computer that's producing the sound. Like, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, there's nothing in here that's producing sound. How am I hearing anything? <laughs> you know, well, it's not, where could it possibly be? You know? I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is sound waves are, you know, they, they curve, but digital is all squares and bits, mm -hmm. and it, it's something gets lost, in, you know, digitally. And I, um, like REM, for example, always put out like 5,000 vinyl records every, even though, you know, just because they have people that would buy them and, and go back to, and I have a record player in my house, love it, you know, spinning the old, but it's, it's, I, I don't know if it'll come back. I think yeah. that's come and gone. One thing you, that you could say is that it may potentially drive more people to the live performances. If the audio, the down, you know, the, the file quality is not the best possible quality. I think there's a lot of other reasons why people are doing more going to live performances now than they used to. But if you want the real high quality experience, go to a show. And that, mm. the, the movie model, I'm, I, I really feel like the problems that the, the music industry has faced for the last 10 years are going to be faced with much better preparation by the movie Absolutely. industry in the last 10 years. So it's not as though they've insulated themselves mm -hmm. for forever. They've just insulated themselves for some time, same as books did. They insulated themselves yep. for some time, now they're facing a lot of the same pirated opportunities for e-books and things like that. And they're suing people. Right. It's or they haven't mm -hmm. sued yet, but they're starting to, to they're suing bring those claims. They're, they're, su they're suing some of their institutional consumers. Yeah. <laughs> we got a librarian. Says the librarian. <laughs> well, but, oh, I'm sorry, go. I'm, I'm going to finish my astute point. <laughs> uh, but it's like, in that sense, I think of a live show as the seeing, seeing a movie in the theater, mm -hmm. and then vinyl as seeing it in a hotel room where you're still willing to pay $8 for it. Yeah. And then downloading it as being something equivalent to renting it from Blockbuster, which they're doing gangbusters sales right now. And then, you know, the equivalent of Spotify is sort of watching it on Netflix. So, you know, it's just like you have these gradations. And the nice thing about subscription services is, again, it feels free and is not free. Right. I think, I think the thing about it is, though, I mean, just practically speaking, people, people t taking it to the point where people have to enter in their credit card information and engage in some kind of a subscription service, it's just gonna, it's gonna limit the, 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 the cash infusion towards artists or towards anybody. I feel like what you have to do is you have to levy a tax on the cable companies that flows towards the PROs or somebody. Somehow the bandwidth 
itself, which is totally measurable. I mean, they, the, I think the, the companies that are providing, you know, the data streams know what things are, are, are creating the larger streams, and you've got to figure out a way to, to levy a tax on those companies that flows back towards the uh, publishers or the PROs. That's what's going to solve it. I, to me, I, and I and I heard you talk about this very idea when you and Jeremy were on uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Morning Edition or something, you know, several weeks back. Um, I thought that was spot on, and and I really do feel like once the legislation kind of happens, and you know the lawyers kind of address it, then it'll it's all going to sort out. But you're, you guys, oh, come we'll on, we'll hurry up, up we'll figure it out. That already happened. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> that already happened with audio tapes. You know, when, when audio tapes first became something that you could record on at home, mm. the little cassette tapes, the, mu the music industry got very upset mm. and said people are taping at home and not yeah. paying us. And the legislation got passed that had payment on every blank audio tape and actually continued. There was, that's why blank CDs and blank music CDs cost different amounts of money for a long time. Mm. There was a payment. It was out of the Audio Home Recording Act. Um, there was payment going back to the collecting societies for blank media. And that was generally considered by the record industry to be an unsuccessful solution. Mm. They weren't getting paid repeatedly. Um, there's also a challenge in terms of if you're, if you're putting a, a, a levy on bandwidth or storage media, um, you, you can tell how much is being used, but you can't tell for what. And if I have to pay for my hard drive, which has a whole lot of open source and open licensed content, the same amount that somebody who is downloading stuff that they're supposed to be paying for but didn't, mm. that's not a very fair tax on the consumer of music. So it's a real challenge. The, the idea of a statutory licensing fee on uh, blank storage media has come up repeatedly, and it is, in my mind, one way to do a really good job of getting more rights back to the collecting societies. It's just that not everything those blank media are being used for, not everything the bandwidth is being used for, is stuff that consumers are supposed to be paying for. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to tell which is which. Mm. And, and also, I mean, you, you give it to the lawyers, I'd say legislators. Um, you, you don't have a true artist advocate in Congress or, you know, you have lobbying groups for the recording industry, the RAAA, the publishing industry, you know, the, I mean, it, and so they're all having uh, their own interest being served and not necessarily the artist. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's really a true artist advocacy, um, except for example, um, in the digital millennium, or actually it was in the satellite home, the satellite home video act, mm -hmm. the recording industry actually stuck in an amendment to section 101 of the, uh, the Copyright Act saying that sound recordings are now by definition works for hire, which means they own it and it cannot be terminated under copyright reversion. And they said it was a technical amendment, which, mm -hmm. and Clinton signed it, and he is, mm -hmm. you know, he's supportive of artist rights. Mm -hmm. And they actually, uh, so the publishers and the artists went crazy and they got them to, to change it back. But um, to rely on the recording industry to preserve artist rights, um, they're actually, I mean, we talk about our opportunity, the record deals coming out are what we call 360 deals mm -hmm. where they're not just going for sound recording income, they're going for touring, merchandising, they want a piece of everything because they're not making money on recordings and so the deals have actually gotten much worse mm -hmm. for artists um, if you want to sign with a major label. Mm -hmm. And the labels don't make anything. That's the damn shame of it, you know. It's all the artists. The artists, everything should accrue to the artists because the labels, are, 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 you know, none of the rest of them make a damn thing. It's all the artists. I mean, that's just the Do truth of it. Do you mean make it. It, make a damn thing, create a damn thing? Yeah, they don't create anything. Mm -hmm. They just, they just are, you know, vultures. Uh, to me, I mean, they just, it's, it's they sucking blood off. They value by getting more people interested well, in the product than the I, 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 but, but they don't, do. but they don't make a thing. To well, me, that's the, <laughs> that, they, they don't make a thing. But they don't weave something out of air. But what if we're know? talking all this, this is my biggest fear about, you, you sing the praises of compartmentalization, saying all I want to do is make the music and let other people take care of that stuff. But then in the same interview, we're calling these people vultures. And that's where I'm really worried. When we're talking, do it yourself, do it together. I'm really worried about all our performance students and McNally Smith going, yeah, let's do it together. We do the cool shit. 
right? Like, we, we'll do the drugs and that. we'll write the songs <laughs> and we'll party and then let's compartmentalize. You, I'm gonna call you a vulture and you're gonna put up posters for me and you're <laughs> gonna put my records in stores and it's, it, when we say do it yourself or do it together, it's, it's, very, it's shorthand for the artist going, Find a sucker. Yeah. Find a sucker to put in my postage. Find That's a sucker true. to do those things. I, don't, I, don't, well, I, dis I disagree well, with that. Well, then don't call them vultures, <laughs> you know? I, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying that the artists have been getting screwed by the business people for a long time. And, it, and that, is the, that is the truth. And there's nothing there without the artist's creation. There's nothing. There's that, that, you talk about a vacuum. There would be a vacuum. The creatives okay. that get... get mistreated and and a lot of money does not flow to them you go look at the a and r guy or you know whatever you know in the old model you go look at these guys i would sit in the studio with these guys and they talk about how their big problem was that one of the palm trees had fallen into their pool <laughs> you know or some jive like that and if you're like sitting in a van driving everywhere around the country to promote the record that they're making money off of you start to feel a little bit like a tool, you know? And it's nice to go sit by their pool, but at the same time, it's, you, you can start to feel a little bit, a little bit jacked, you know? That's like a, when they took you out to lunch and would charge you, say, and charge you back. Uh, you mean, and put I want to take advance? you out to lunch? Yeah. yeah. Because you're, you're paying for everything. Well, and, and okay, this can't be streamed live, but um, I'm gonna take the record company position just for a second, just to put it in perspective of what they used to do and what they're not doing today. In the old days, they could distribute. They could promote. They could get you on David Letterman. Mm -hmm. You know, they could give you deficit tour support so you could go promote the album. I mean, there were a lot of things that record labels did. Um, and there were people like Clive Davis who were actually going out trying to find talent and get it out. Mm -hmm. You know, at a time in the 60s and 70s where we went through an amazingly creative boom of music, new things. I mean, you know, there hasn't been a revolution in music, I think, for 15 years probably. Whereas now, like I said, it's the conglomeration, it's the accountants, Vivendi, Sony, Seagrams, you know, mm -hmm. all thinking about the next quarter. And, and the vision people, the true music people, mm -hmm. are not there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then you throw in, now we want your merchandising and we want your touring because we're not making it elsewhere the deal that you used to strike is not there anymore and it's not a great deal for artists mm -hmm. that's the problem mm -hmm. it used to be um did record companies uh not pay royalties and you know withhold money of course and we i mean we have audits going on a couple different artists mm -hmm. right now because we know with hit songs they'll you know but but they did serve a purpose mm -hmm. and i think that purpose of what they did uh is is not as great anymore they're not doing what they did in the past to break artists. I would also argue that there was a sort of gatekeeping quality to the record industry. And again, I don't want to say in the golden age, you know, there's, there's lots of great music being created now. I just think because of the access of technology and the ability of anyone to make a record, let's be honest, there's a lot of music that's being produced right now that would not have been produced 15 years ago, just because the record labels wouldn't have put it out there. And that's not to say they didn't put a lot of crap out to the world. But now anybody can make a record in their basement and, and sort of put it out to the world. So there's just this immense amount of stuff. And when you look at the 60s and 70s, there was a sort of quality control. You know, you wouldn't have, you're not going to have Led Zeppelins again because right. there isn't the kind of million dollar investment of somebody that's basically being a patron. Kickstarter can do some pretty remarkable things. Crowdsourcing can come up with some great things, but I just don't know if you're going to have the sort of explosion of creativity. Mm -hmm. And I might be mourning that a little bit, but... Well, speaking, this is definitely the librarian side of me coming out, but librarians way historically used to be gatekeepers very intentionally. They used to curate their collections. Public libraries only had things that would improve your mind. And there's been a big change in the profession in the last 50 years, especially, to saying, you know, we do, we get people information, we get people cultural content, um, and we don't judge what it is they want. Because is it really a bad thing that there's more music out there? Even if some of it's not qualitatively bad, uh, not qualitatively good, is it, is it better that there are more people making music? Is there, 
from my perspective, the social value of more people feeling creative, more people creating things, even if I look at it and go, wow, I don't want to listen to that, there's, there's value to me in them having that opportunity. Um, this is very, I'm, you know, socialist about culture. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want more people making more. I think we all benefit from that. It's true that it's harder to find the best stuff in yeah. that. It, it, the gems may get flooded. And also are there people who just are not going to create because there isn't the financial incentive because they need to kind of prioritize about mm -hmm. their lives and, and making money. I mean, are we going to lose some great songwriters mm -hmm. in, in this? I think there's a really interesting parallel with movies. A lot of people keep talking about how as movie piracy increases, we're not going to have great blockbuster, blockbuster movies anymore. I, I love blockbuster movies. I like really stupid movies. I would give up the Avengers to keep YouTube and to keep all the weird and crazy things that people are making and uploading there. Because what an amazing value to the world, to the individuals who made it, to those of us who get to see how weird and crazy all of our fellow creative people are. I, I, I but as I say, I'm a socialist about culture. So. Cat videos. Cat <laughs> videos. The Internet Everybody Cat Video cat Film videos. Festival last summer. Right, I mean, there's yeah. something there. Right, yeah. well, is music less of a meritocracy today? Because, I mean, it's like, granted, Adam Young, great fluke. Adam Young's parents had a basement. Right? So he wasn't in his mom's apartment where she said, shut up, Adam. He goes down to a big basement. He had a video camera. He had a computer that had MySpace on it. And just so I don't sound like some sort of class warrior, I come from a privileged, black, privileged background. I knew it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You saw the jacket. But the thing <laughs> is, it's like, so when the High Respects van broke down, yeah. I had a dad I could call. A lot of guys didn't. And if they didn't, that might have been their last tour. And it was my second tour out of 10. As a, you know, so the question is, when record labels were going, oh, how does this actually sound based purely on how the music sounds? And, and Clive thinking they're going to make money off of it. Yeah. Did you have a better shot at an underprivileged artist to, to get screwed, but to get screwed popularly? You know, to get screwed and be famous? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it less of a meritocracy today? Well, and in that situation, it was simply in part, I mean, the kids were eating it up. I mean, it was a, a situation where I had never really, because I've always had kind of sensed um, where music came from and why the kids like it. And with Adam Young, the first time I saw him, he came out and he had this, this hoodie and a computer, you know, and all these kids with their kind of mousy hair and they're all, you know, doing electronic stuff, you know, on the internet. And I'm like, my God, what, you know? And so it was a totally new thing for me. And it's electronica, mm -hmm. uh, which is a growing art form. Um, and, and I do think the, the viral nature of what happened, kind of like your cat video, you know, Adam Young got a lot of attention. People said, you got to check this out. Mm -hmm. um, boom. And, and so I'm just saying um, there, there is opportunity for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, how to aggregate and get the Internet to come and see you, I mean, good luck. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know how that's done. I'm not an expert in online advertising, but... There's it, a lot of experts out there right yeah. now that are <laughs> very happy to take your money. Yeah. 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 That's right. Go viral. But, but Sean is right that there is a... There's a um, I, I think it's not new though. I think the old system was just as much a problem for the kid who's sharing an apartment with mom and who doesn't have a basement. There is a problem of who gets to make the impression on the public. The internet gives some people a new opportunity to make an impression on the public. The internet does not give everybody that opportunity. Kickstarter gets funded much more easily for nerd rock than it does for a hip hop album because the, the, the groups who are doing various things online and also who have the money to fund the things they love are different. And so if we, if we you know, go into this as it's just a business question and you don't think about who has access to the modes of business you're talking about, that's a problem too. I have frequent conversations with teachers and public librarians about what they shouldn't let people do on their public workstations. And I can understand they don't want the library to get sued. At the same time, if they are the only place a kid has to make a new music video, and they say, you can't use our computers to do that because we might get sued, they're cutting off access to people who have no other access. And what is the value to the institution and, and with you know, risk versus social um, value as a result? Well, I think um, you know, we, we, the whole point here was the culture of free and how we 
you know, figure out how to monetize and actually reward artists. And I don't think anybody disagrees necessarily that the creator should be compensated. Okay, I, I really don't believe that people say, well, it's the internet, it's free, I can have it. I mean, if they truly understood and were educated that, no, these are rights of artists, they create this work, they're entitled to compensation, uh, most people would say, fine. And it's not, you know, 99 cents for a song, I mean, big deal. You spend 250 on a latte, pay, you know, for the music. And that's really, um, but, but in the, you know, when we talked about this, the genie is out of the bottle, that's mm -hmm. the problem. We can't put it back in. I don't know how we do that. Thank Good. you. So Thanks, much. Harry. Oh, thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank you all yeah. for thank coming. You. Yeah. Yeah. You killed yeah. me as usual. Tim, good thank to you see you. See you. Yeah, yeah, good to see you. I don't think of you as an artist. Sorry, Jerry. Well, I'm an artist. <laughs> 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 I, I hope you know where I'm coming from. Listen, man, we're talking about.